on time. So uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to our uh, next installment of our Pioneers in Biomedical Research Seminar Series here at the BTCRI. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, Dr. Anthony Lamancia from George Washington University. Uh, Dr. Lamancia did his undergraduate work at Chicago, in the at the University of Chicago, uh, his PhD at Yale University in Neuroscience, where he worked with one of the true giants in the field, Dr. Pashka Rakesh. Uh, and then went on uh, to do postdoctoral training at WashU, again working with one of the true giants in the field, Dale Purvis, uh, and then moved uh, along with uh, Dale down to uh, North Carolina, and, and uh, Anthony held a faculty position uh, at Duke University uh, uh, for a while, and then also while he was there as a junior faculty member, ran their uh, transgenic animal corps. I don't know how he balanced doing that with everything else he was doing at the time, but good, good for them that he was there to bring that to them. Uh, and then he moved up the road or down the road, whichever it might be, to uh, Chapel Hill to the University of North Carolina, kind of parallel across there, and uh, had a very, very successful run as a faculty member there in cell and molecular physiology. And then about, about seven years ago or so, they uh, attracted him to leave North Carolina and come up to the district, to George Washington University, just about the same time that a bunch of us were setting this place up. Uh, Dr. LaMancha was setting up a new program at GW. Uh, which he has directed. He is the founding director of the Institute for Neuroscience at George Washington University. And just this last year, he was installed uh, as the Lieberman Professor of Neuroscience at a ceremony that I actually watched online. It's pretty cool, uh, recognizing uh, his contributions. Um, I forgot to mention along the way, too, even as an undergraduate student at the University of Chicago, uh, Dr. LaMancha was very active in research and again working with yet another giant in the field, Ray Guillory. Uh, where he, I think, really cut his eye teeth on some of the work that's led him to where he is today and the use of genetics and understanding development of the nervous system uh, along the way. And so, you know, you often find uh, people uh, in our field and other fields that have trained with the best of the best, and it's never a guarantee, in my humble opinion, that they're going to be one of the best of the best. You can have a great pedigree sometimes <laughs> or hide behind those great people around you, but this is a kind of definitely not that type of example. Dr. LaMancha has arisen himself to become one of the preeminent developmental neurobiologists after training with some of the, some of the best as well and has set up his own programs and lab that have been absolutely leading the way uh, in very important areas. And so just uh, briefly by way of uh, background about his work, uh, he's, as I said, uh, is a pioneer in developmental neurobiology and our understanding of signaling pathways and regulation of transcription factors in genes and early, early brain development. He's made great use of uh, certain systems that lend themselves, I think, very nicely to these types of studies, including the olfactory system. Uh, early on, he was uh, pioneering some in vivo imaging techniques to look at uh, glomerular and olfactory bulb organization during development, and has used a variety of molecular and genetic techniques to probe and understand uh, particular uh, groups of genes and uh, that are expressed in uh, neurons and different parts of the nervous system, and they're key role in neurogenesis, in cell migration, pathfinding, and the organization and assembly of neural circuits. And even though I think it's fair to say that Dr. LaMancha is truly a basic scientist at heart and very fundamental in his approach and discoveries, he also takes a very translational approach and his work has very direct implications that uh, extend into the clinic. Uh, his work on DeGeorge, the 2211 uh, deletion syndrome, uh, has given some very exciting insights uh, using the mouse model in 16 to look at uh, particular uh, genes involved in mitochondrial function, for example, in neurons. And that is really serving as a bridge in many ways between fundamental uh, mouse-based uh, basic work and translational and clinical work in the human condition. And so I'll just end by saying we had a great conversation at dinner last night about, I don't know, philosophy of neuroscience and how to do good neuroscience and so forth. It was very refreshing to hear somebody who, who not only is, is right in the trenches producing the best technical papers, but who has that sort of very broad view of what the field is about and what the questions are and how to approach it. So we're very fortunate to have Dr. LaMancha here today. Please join me in welcoming him to the BTCRI. You must have invited the wrong person because I, I mean, I would like to hear that guy talk. <laughs> Um, Mike, thank you. Thank you for this invitation. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, so, you know, I think as Mike alluded, um, over the years, um, I've become more and more interested in issues of how 
early developmental mechanisms actually influence the ultimate assembly and function of circuits. And in order to look at this problem, we had a lot of challenges. One was to actually identify what the problem was. The other was to avoid the easy sort of wish fulfillment of taking human conditions and immediately declaring that they are um, available to us in mouse. Um, so what I instead want to do is have you consider that there is a broad range of syndromic and non-syndromic issues that are all together called neurodevelopmental disorders. Now, some of the ones that you are aware of in humans are things like autistic spectrum disorder, schizophrenia, intellectual disability, et cetera. And I think these are nodes for thinking about human neurodevelopmental disorders that raise the issue of something that's broad. And since I'm supposed to be pretending to be a pioneer in biomedical research, and as I said last night, I did not come here in my Conestoga wagon, I at least thought I would try to open it up a little bit and sort of you know, tell you about neurodevelopmental disorders in the news, the prevalence of autism, autistic spectrum disorder diagnoses has gone to 1 in 68. As you can see there, if you can see the little icons in suits rather than dresses, it is predominant, five times more prevalent in males than females. And this cannot be completely um, explained by diagnostic substitution, by social influence, which is basically means parents get more concerned and bring their kids to clinics. Um, there is a contribution for parental age. Geographic clusters means, you know, in cities where there's more awareness, um, kids are more likely to be seen. But the biggest group is the unexplained group. And the increase, either if it's identification or incidence, says that this is really an urgent, pub urgent public health problem because like many, many neurodevelopmental disorders, they strike early, they compromise the individual through a lifetime, there is cost to families, et cetera. So this is something that needs to be addressed. And like any major um, health problem, in order to understand the disease mechanisms and improve diagnosis and treatment and prevention, you really have to look at the mechanisms and you have to figure out ways that are intellectually valid to do that. Now, you know, when you think about these problems, and particularly when you start from the point of view of the human disorders, autism or whatever, you just get an enormous amount of noise. And this wordle, I didn't know that these were called wordles until about six months ago, but, you know, I, as soon as I learned, I decided to use the approach. I, what I want to do is I want to clear away all of the background noise and just focus on one hypothesis that involves circuitry that is ultimately quantitative and that we can look at and that has actually been identified from analyses of many human neurodevelopmental disorders as a possible way of explaining ultimately the pathology. And that is, is that either the individuals, particularly their cerebral cortices, are underconnected or they're overconnected. And so this is something that's quantifiable. If you think about it in the right way and use animal models in an appropriate way, because of course the quantification in humans is all reflected in direct measures of um, fMRI and MRI mediated um, approaches as well as other monitoring of physiological um, measures. But I really want to take this apart at the cell biological level. And so how are we going to do that? So if we think about generally what causes neurodevelopmental disorders, the best guess from everything that's available is altered cortical connections. But that's a little bit vague. Um, and, but the, that guess is offered because the cognitive and social deficits are associated with this altered connectivity. And of course, those capacities are thought to be critically mediated by cortical circuitry. So there are a lot of current hypotheses if you look in the, human, in the literature on human neurodevelopmental disorders. One is that there's completely normal connectivity, but at the level of individual synapses and cellular mechanisms, there's some sort of functional change. So that's one possibility. The other is, is that there's overconnectivity. There's brain overgrowth. You maintain neurons and cells and processes that would normally be 
Um, eliminated or pruned is the fashionable term, which I despise. Um, but at any rate, you would have more, and somehow that quantitative change upward would cause a change in function. Another possibility is that you actually don't have enough. Now, there is also a number of ways that you could get to underconnectivity. You could either change neurogenesis, you could change specificity so that you have selective changes in proportions of neurons so that there would be one population underconnected because there weren't enough um, versus another that was not. Or you could have a quantitatively normal population, but they could be misconnected. There are the instructions for establishing appropriate connections, whether they were genomic and molecular, um, and therefore more constraining, or activity and experience dependent are some way altered, causing changes in the circuit conformation without quantitative changes. So this is really what I want to take apart. It's a very simple quantitative issue, but I want to take that apart mechanistically. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to use a human genomic syndrome, the 22Q11 deletion syndrome. It's actually a micro deletion at, um, on chromosome 22 on the long arm, the Q arm, at position Q11.2. Um, it's minimally 32 genes in the human. There are a number of um, early developmental clinical features shown here. And then as the children mature, they develop a suite of cognitive and social deficits. Um, in the mouse model, we and others have shown that it precisely models all of the major clinical features that are seen early. This is the mouse deletion of the orthologous genes on chromosome 16 in the mouse, which is a combination of human chromosome 22 and 21. Um, and when we look at the mature mouse, what we see is, of course, these are the disease entities that are associated. And this is nearly 100% of these kids will be clinically diagnosed with one of these four disorders. Autism early and schizophrenia as an early onset are the most common, but 100% of them practically show up with something in clinic. And of course, Mice don't get any of these things. If anybody says that they do, send them to me and I, we will have a discussion. But what mice can be assayed for are a number of behaviors that may address, in general ways, this issue. Cellular brain pathology that often can reflect specific molecular and genetic mechanisms. And circuit dysfunction. So, the approach generally that I'm going to take is I'm going to assess orthologous genes and cellular mechanisms and molecular mechanisms of cortical development. And we're going to look at them through the lens of this issue of underconnected versus overconnected. So what is it genomically that we're talking about in humans? The 22Q11.2 or 22Q11DS deletion syndrome is caused by a minimal deletion of 1.5 megabases on chromosome 22. There are 32 genes in this region, um, of which 28 are represented orthologously in the mouse. The other four that are, are not in mouse chromosome 16 are in other locations, and they're not expressed in the brain. Um, here is the mouse orthologous region. And there actually are, there are two mice, one that we have developed in collaboration with Raj Kuchulapati, who is now at Harvard, but was at Mount Sinai at the time that we started this. Group one, the same mouse with a different name made by a group at Columbia. And so what we're going to do is this 1.5 megabase deletion, in fact, there have been some papers from looking at human patients, this is not only sufficient to create all of the spectrum of phenotypes, which are variable from individual to individual, but actually for the diagnosis, actually interesting, of autistic spectrum disorders, the 1.5 megabase deletion is all that's needed. And so this really identifies these genes in this region and their orthologs in the mouse as potential contributors in some way to regulating the development and emergent functions of cortical circuits. And so we're going to look at this in the large deletion mouse, which is the 
delete, full deletion of the 28 orthologs. Um, and then we're going to use a number of genetic tools, um, including single gene deletions um, and conditional alleles within the region to test this hypothesis. So that's our hypothesis. And you know, if you're going to test under or over connectivity, particularly at the cellular level, you need numbers. So the other thing is, is that general numbers, just looking through the brains, ch choosing your favorite spot and counting something, doesn't seem to make sense, or it didn't make sense to us. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to do this analysis in the context of a behavioral change that referred to a specific circuit. And so the behavior that we decided to look at is a reversal learning behavior that is thought to engage the mouse's equivalent of what you might refer to as working memory or executive function. Now again, making these comparisons between human or primate complex cognitive behaviors and those in the mouse is a tricky business. And so I don't want to suggest that this is anything except what a mouse is good at that we can measure. But when we look at the performance of a mouse on this task, and we look at a wild type versus large deletion, what we see is that, first of all, the mean performance is diminished. It takes them far longer in terms of sessions to criterion to actually learn this task, which is basically they learn independent of position that a grading of a particular um, direction gives them a food reward at a distal location that is not um, spatially um, necessary for them to recall. And then they have to learn to reverse the rule in terms of the direction of the grading. Um, overall, they do not do as well. But as you can see, the other thing that's increased is the variability, which is was not a surprise to us. But the other thing that was important is that we knew that this behavior relied critically on cortical cortical connections without the contribution, significant contribution, of any other subcortical circuitry. And particularly, we knew based on lesion studies, physiological studies, and now some optogenetics, that actually the circuit between this area of medial frontal cortex, medial frontal association cortex, I am not so daring as to call this prefrontal cortex because I don't know that it is, um, but it's the bit at the front and in the middle, to the lateral entorhinal cortex. Now, we've made that a little bit smaller here, but it's actually a vast expanse of. Now, if there are lesions in either of these places without compromising anything else, or if you look at the physiological activity during this behavior, et cetera, these two cortical regions and the connectivity between them is key for the performance. And if you do lesions, you get this sort of change, in fact, at the same magnitude um, in terms of the means. So this is the circuit that we're looking at. This is the behavior that that circuit mediates. This is the change in the animal. So um, the question is, does this give us a testable hypothesis? And it does. And that is, is that the deletion in some way is disrupting these medial frontal to lateral and rhinal cortical cortical connections. And it's the cortical cortical connections made primarily by the layer 2 3 projection neurons that we're focusing on. So, one of the things that we considered initially was that projection neuron density and fate, particularly and specifically in layer 2 3, might be altered. And we knew that these cells, primarily, although not exclusively, are the cells whose axons extend from one cortical region and make connections with other cortical regions. So we had an initial hint that the projection neuron frequency in layer 2, 3, in association cortices particular, including um, and the medial frontal association cortex and the lateral entorhinal cortex, were diminished. And that was because the basal progenitors, this subset of intermediate progenitors that give rise to cortical projection neurons, particularly the layer 2-3 projection neurons, for reasons that I won't explain to you today, but we're getting a better sense of, are proliferatively incapacitated, and they don't make the right 
number of layer 2, 3 projection neurons in association cortices to begin with. So the first question we had was, well, you could have a net change in number, but that doesn't necessarily mean that specific projections, for example, that between the lateral and arinal and the medial frontal, are actually diminished. So well, the, the other thing that we knew was that even so, if we just looked at the performance, and now we're taking into account the variability, there were these poor performers and these guys who were more like the wild type. And we just correlated with the number of projection neurons in layer 2, 3 of the medial frontal association cortex. We saw a beautiful correlation between the level of performance the, those that were more like the wild type animals in terms of their layer 2, 3 projection neuron frequency had wild type behavioral performance, and those who were not, and this will just give you a sense of those are the wild type like mutants, and you can see that their performance is not dissimilar with some variation from the, their wild type counterparts, where this group of poor performers actually also has the lowest frequency of layer 2, 3 projection neurons in the medial frontal association cortex. So is this a specific quantitative change in projections? Well, what we could do is we actually have tried to make plotting, uh, looking quantitatively at cortical cortical connectivity, um, we've tried to build that into a space so that it's rather like taking a standard um, fMRI or MRI space and mapping and counting individual cells throughout the cortical mantle. So what we do is we do polar plots of these. We've showed that in the large Dell or the wild type, the primary retrograde labeled cells after an injection into the medial frontal association cortex are in layer 2-3, so we haven't had a laminar shift in terms of what's labeled. But what we can do now is we can actually, and what we've done is these are high, very high resolution um, tiled images of an entire set series of standardized sections that are based on location, and we can plot quantitatively in the large deletion or in the wild type the density of um, retrogradely labeled neurons in the space. And the red bars are places where there are at least five times, and this is significant over several animals in each class, five times more um, retrogradely labeled neurons. And the black bars are where there are five times fewer retrogradely labeled neurons. This is the lateral and arinal projection. This is the same thing in the large deletion, and this is this region shown here, and this is clearly underconnected. Now, the entire brain, the connections from the medial frontal association cortex that we can label retrogradely, some of them do show some quantitative overconnectivity, but for the circuit that we're particularly interested in, there is a quantitative decrease. Uh, robust and statistically verifiable decrease in projections. So the next thing that we did, and we did this in collaboration with Diego Contreras, is that we actually stimulated the medial frontal asso association cortex um, and, also and also some lateral areas, and then we recorded from the its lateral medial frontal association cortex. And we used depth electrodes that actually allowed us, through looking at frequency of, of multi-unit activity, um, look at the overall drive of the, um, in the medial frontal association cortex from those other cort cortical areas that define the circuit. This is the wild type, and this is the large deletion, and what we see is this is actually the region that corresponds to layer two and three um, along the depth electrode, and we see that we have lost the activation that's specific to the um, the stimulus from those areas in the medial frontal association cortex. So this quantitative change in projections from layer 2, 3 projection neurons actually reads out as a physiological change in terms of overall activity. So what does that really mean? Well, we know that projection neuron density in fate has been diminished now, and we know that there's actually a specific decrease in layer 2, 3 mediated cortical, cortical projections. 
But what is a cellular basis for underconnectivity? And this is where we actually decided that we needed to look more in depth and more quantitatively at the projection neurons themselves. And we knew that dendritic and axonal growth in size and complexity is really the quantitative foundation for looking at connectivity at quantitatively. So we're now going to look at that, and we had to think of, well, how do you, in the cortex, really count this aspect of connectivity? So the first thing is, is we had to selectively visualize and measure individual projection neurons. And the way that we did this was we read the large deletion with a Cux2 um, promoter driving um, a conditional creep. And this Cux2 promoter, Cux2 is only expressed almost exclusively in layer 2, 3 projection neurons, particularly in the perinatal period. So what we could do is we could um, also cross in a reporter. We could give, and we titrated the level of tamoxifen so that we basically got the molecular equivalent of a Golgi. We cut very thick sections. We had single cells labeled. We knew they were layer 2, 3 projection neurons. And we actually did a volumetric reconstruction of the entire cell and then measured the volume. So we're not doing camera loose of the projections or anything. We are looking three-dimensionally at the dendrite, dendritic arbors. And we also visualized and quantified the synapses on these cells. We could use um, this backscatter EM where basically it's zoomable so we could identify the projection neurons in layer 2, 3 clearly and then we could quantify all sorts of cytological elements to look to see whether or not at the synaptic level and at the, integri the integrity of the postsynaptic specializations whether or not there was a quantitative change. So the first thing that we saw is that, and this is, you know, 100 neurons over eight animals each, there is a really substantial change in dendritic growth and branching. Um, it's actually a 50% change or more, particularly in the apical dendrites of layer 2, 3 projection neurons. And when we look at these cells cytologically, we see that they are very different in the large cell. We see that they're high, they can be highly vascularized. We lose nuclear indentations. There's a paucity of mitochondria, and there's a paucity of organelles, both in the cytoplasm peri- um, and also in the apical dendrite. And when we look at a little bit closer magnification and quantify this, what we see is that both in the apical dendrite of these layer 2, 3 projection neurons and in the neuropil, we see these exploded mitochondria and we see also that mitochondrial frequency has diminished really dramatically. Now, these cells aren't dead. Nevertheless, they have this remarkable change. And when we look at the presynaptic specializations, both in the, on the dendrite and the neuropil, we see a similar decrease. And these are actually significant. I don't know what happened to that um, asterisk. And when we look at the postsynaptic specializations and the vesicle density in individual synapses, what we see is in the large cell, particularly in the presynaptic profiles, we see this ex sort of expanded um, swollen morphology we see overall changes in the way that the vesicles are clustered at the presynaptic specialization and also in the overall frequency of vesicles. So there definitely are several indications quantitatively that circuits have changed and the, in this particular region, and we are looking prime, in the medial frontal association cortex primarily to do these measures, um, that there is underconnectivity. Now, why does this happen? And why does this sort of special type of either failure of growth or failure of maintenance of layer 2, 3 projection neurons, cytological and morphological integrity occur? And how does that also relate ultimately to the circuit disconnectivity? So the question that we then had was, was that how does this disrupt initial growth and differentiation? And the hint that we had was the change in mitochondrial um, morphology. And we decided that we were going to have to take this apart, not in the whole animal initially, but in a very well-characterized, I mean, we changed a lot of things, 
cortical culture system where we knew we were only looking at layer 2, 3 projection neurons and that we could get distinct differentiation of the dendritic and axonal compartments. We characterize the system. It is primarily neurons and it is primarily based on the expression of Cux2 and this is CTIP2 which is a layer 5, 6 projection neuron marker. We are primarily, as well as we can re, um, recognize, looking at layer 2, 3 projection neurons in the in vitro system. So the first thing we saw, and you can see this visually, is that we see, and this is now over a five-day period, which is consistent with the idea that this is a developmental problem initially, although there could be further degenerative issues that we see a failure of dendritic growth and we also see that the axon is actually observably shorter. And when we quantify this, we see a change. The change is the overall magnitude is a little less. This may be because we're looking at the beginning aspects of this um, in terms of the dendritic changes or this may be just a feature of the difference between in vitro and in vivo observations. But we then asked, well, what's changing other than the overall growth? And because of the mitochondrial change, we decided to look, first of all, at a metric of just overall mitochondrial metabolic health. And that is the genesis of reactive oxygen species. We looked both in mitochondria individually as well as in the cytoplasm. And what you can see here, even looking, is that there seems to be an increase in label. And what this label is proportionate to, and that's what's measured, is an increase in reactive oxygen species within mitochondria and in the cell body in general. And that is actually a substantial increase. So there is some sort of metabolic change, both in the mitochondria and then read out into the cytoplasm, that increases reactive oxygen species. And so we thought, well, what could be causing this? And we knew from previous work in the lab that the largest functional group of genes within the minimal critical deleted region actually turned out to be genes expressed in the mitochondria. So they are those six genes there. And what we did was we did an siRNA screen where we lowered the expression of each of those genes in our cultured layer 2, 3 projection neurons. And we saw which, if any, might recapitulate or phenocopy the total large DEL um, phenotype. And only one did, and it's this gene, TXNRD2, which encodes the thioredoxin reductase 2. And this turns out from evidence really very recent, this is the rate limiting step for the clearance of reactive oxygen species and via the TCA cycle, ATP genesis in neurons, particularly mammalian neurons. So this actually, you know, it was interesting. And this is, what, this is what these cells look like. Again, you can see the change in the dendritic morphology and the axon morphology. And quantitatively, um, it is almost identical to that which we see in the large DEL in vitro. And also, we know that TXNRD2 is expressed in this punctate pattern. This is actually the protein in these cells, so we're looking at the right thing. And when we look at the TXNRD2 um, knockdown wild type neurons, we see the same increase in reactive oxygen species that we see in the large DEL. And furthermore, um, we can actually rescue that phenotype both at the morphogenetic level and, as I will show you, at the level of ROS genesis by just overexpressing TXNRD2 in the large DEL. Um, neurons. And so this is the morphogenetic rescue, and you see that when we overexpress TXNRD2 in a large DEL neuron, it comes right back up to the wild type level, both the dendritic and axonal measures. And also, when we look at um, ROS, we lower ROS levels by overexpressing TXNRD2 in the large DEL back to wild type levels. So what this tells us is that TXNRD2 is likely to be a causal um, contributor to this phenotype that we're seeing via some sort of dysregulation of mitochondrial metabolism. So that we know that TXNRD2 is down, distinguishing mitochondria from, in large DEL, from their healthy mitochondrial counterparts. But also this predicts that 
this actually will change the stoichiometry of, of electron transfer, um, available electrons through um, free radical oxygen species in a way that should diminish ATP production. So we looked at that, and when we measure ATP production, as predicted, it diminishes significantly, um, but in a way that does not lead to apoptosis. It, these cells survive, but they are not as metabolically um, efficient. So a critical test of this is, you know, this is all nice in a dish, but does this actually happen in vivo? So what we did was we did selective in vivo heterozygous mutation of TXNRD2 only in layer 2, 3 projection neurons on the background of wild type cells otherwise. So what we did was we bred in a flox TXNRD2 allele um, with the Cux2 pre-ERT promoter. We actually then uh, crossed this line with a YFP reporter. And in this genotype, we titrated the tamoxifen so that we were only recombining TXNRD2. And the assumption is, and it's a, it's a safe assumption, that we were also labeling those cells that were recombined. So now what we're going to do is we're going to ask whether or not if we have a cell autonomous um, heterozygous deletion of TXNRD2 in the medial frontal association cortex and other layer 2, 3 projection neurons, but we measured NPAC, um, whether or not there is a similar dendritic change. Now, the one thing that we knew, we knew this from in situ, and then we demonstrated this with um, immunofluorescence, is that this is a marker for projection neurons, and it's in the nuclei, it's SATB2. And this is TXNRD2 immunoreactivity. And immunoreactivity is seen specifically and selectively in a subpopulation of layer 2, 3 projection neurons. And the immunoreactivity, just like the message, is enhanced in layer 2, 3. There is some light expression of this in 5 and 6 and in the intermediate layers. But the highest expression seems to be both at the message and protein level in layer 2, 3. So this gave us a little bit more specificity, but the answer was very clear, and you can see that by looking at it. We get exactly the same phenotype in individual layer 2, 3 projection neurons if we take TXNRD2 out heterozygously. And, yeah? There is a subset of inner neurons, and we're very interested in what those are. Um, we think they're a subset of the parvel boom, and, and we don't know whether or not it's the fast spiking. And so we're, we're looking at that. But that is an, an important question, but we're not gonna, I, I, we don't have definitive data to deal with that yet. So this led us to, there's a lot more biology to be done there, but we know now that there is underconnectivity at the projection level, at the physiological level, at the cellular level and at the synaptic level, quantitatively, within this circuit that mediates this particular behavior. And we know that it is in some way reflecting the dysregulation of this TXNRD2-dependent pathway for ATP genesis and reactive oxygen species clearance. And then we took a flyer. We thought, well, if the issue is reactive oxygen species, why not try a free radical scavenger and see if it changes anything of this? And so what we did was we used the free radical scavenger N-acetylcysteine. It's an FDA-approved nutritional supplement. I thought this was snake oil, but one of the graduate students and two of the postdocs who were working on this persuaded me after I was dragged kicking and screaming. But it made sense in terms of the metabolic changes, and so we gave it a shot. Now, the first thing is, and I'm not going to show you the detailed data, is that this worked like a charm in vitro. So if we gave the cultures and acetylcysteine at a fairly low uh, concentration, we restored both dendritic and axonal growth in the same way that rescuing with TXNRD2 overexpression in the large gel would do. Um, but the question is, is, could we see anything in vivo that actually 
um, supported any activity for this stuff. Now, it's known that um, N-acetylcysteine is made available to mice via maternal milk production from birth onwards. So what we did was we did basically a chronic treatment with N-acetylcysteine, and we at, from birth onward, we haven't looked at critical periods for this yet, but basically what we're doing is we're using this raw scavenger, and what this predicted first of all is that if this lowers the reactive oxygen species, it should normalize the ATP production, and ATP production should come back to normal level. And that's exactly what happened. So this was encouraging, and we thought, well, maybe there's something going on here. So then we looked at the layer 2, 3 projection neurons using our genetic Golgi trick. And what we saw, you can see this qualitatively, but what we saw quantitatively is that the large Dell comes right back up to the wild type um, dendritic length and branching measurements um, with this chronic N-acetylcysteine treatment. So we've restored the basic metabolic change in terms of ATP genesis, and we've restored the dendritic growth and branching. Um, now, do we change the synaptic phenotypes? The answer is yes. And in all cases, so what you're looking at here in blue is the wild type mean and the large deletion mean. In the presence of NAC, the mitochondrial frequency is not rescued in dendrites or in axons to the wild type level, but it is significantly increased over the large deletion level. The presynaptic specializations, however, come right back up to the wild type levels, as do the postsynaptic specializations, and interestingly, the, the vesicle density increases. And we think that some of this variability is due to the fact that this is cell selective. We think that the terminals that we're looking at that lose vesicle density and have the issues are actually corticocortical terminals, but we're not 100% sure of that, and we have more work to do to nail that down. And again, for the other terminals, GABAergic terminals, neuromodulatory terminals, et cetera, we don't think that this is actually occurring. So somehow this seems to be potentially layer two, three specific. So finally, what else can this stuff do? If we correct the cellular phenotypes, does it really change that behavior that we, I've told you relies on this circuit that I've shown you quantitatively is underconnected? And the answer is yes. So in this initial sample, we not only reduce the variability, this group and the wild-type counterparts come back to the large scale, comes back to wild-type performance. And we're now replicating this, and it is replicating just fine. So what does this tell us? And this has nothing to do with autism. It just says in a specific circuit that we've looked at, in this murine model of a genomic lesion that's associated with this broad range of neurodevelopmental disorders, that specific underconnectivity in a circuit mediated by a particular cell type and working through a particular molecular mechanism that reflects the genomic, the initial genomic insult, actually leads to cellular pathology that's consistent with underconnectivity. And if you fix that pathology, you fix the behavioral deficit that is caused by disrupting the circuit. So what have I shown you? Well, it seems like there is underconnectivity that is dependent on the regulation of mitochondrial metabolism via the um, homeostasis of reactive oxygen species and the contribution of that homeostatic mechanism to the genesis of ATP. So somehow, bioenergetically, these cells become homeostatically disrupted and you get a change both in behavior, dendritic morphology, and synaptic um, integrity. And I've also told you that if we fix those cellular issues of underconnectivity, we actually restore um, the behavioral deficit that's associated with the circuit that appears to be underconnected. Now, this raises a possibility, and this is actually sort of a post hoc reasoning. Um, if you look through the literature recently, particularly in ASD and schizophrenia, there are a lot of anecdotal reports in small patient populations that 
antioxidant free radical scavengers actually can improve symptoms. Now, I don't want you running away and thinking that all we need to do is, you know, load up these individuals on um, antioxidants. However, it is interesting that the, there is a possibility that for some of these neurodevelopmental disorders, the final common pathway for pathogenesis may actually be through metabolic dysregulation that doesn't lead to frank apoptosis or cell death, but rather this intermediate stage, which in uh, preliminary evidence that I won't tell you about today, seems to be a form of autophagic change. So this autophagy has been associated with neurodegeneration in adult neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease and various forms of dementia. But we think this is actually a developmentally instantiated <coughs> autophagic change, and we now are working to um, confirm that at the cell biological molecular level. So the data says at least for 22Q11 deletion in this mouse model, the way that cognitive deficits in the mouse arise is through, at least in this particular behavior mediated by this particular circuit, through underconnectivity. So if we go back to our more general hypotheses, at least for this example, we've eliminated those. Misconnectivity isn't completely off the table, so I'm not going to take it away completely, but certainly underconnectivity in this particular example can be demonstrated not indirectly but through quantitatively robust cell biological and molecular measurements. Um, and this raises the opportunity, particularly because this is mediated through mitochondrial metabolism, which is a very accessible target for therapeutic intervention. Whether or not rational therapies that target mitochondria either from postnatal development onward or even acutely once individuals have been diagnosed with any of these sort of behavioral disruptions can actually be not only a feel-good therapy, but actually a rational basis for developing interventions that are effective. And so with that, I will thank the people who did the work, particularly Alejandra Fernandez, a really gifted graduate student in the lab, and Dan Meekin, a postdoc, um, my constant collaborator through all of this, Tom Maynard, um, made important contributions. Larry Rothblatt at DW is our behavioral uh, collaborator, and he was one of the pioneers of the touchscreen uh, technology for testing mouse frontal cortical um, uh, function. Anastas Pratiloff is our imaging guru. Um, these folks in my lab did a lot of the work. Diego and Nina did all of the physiology. <laughs> these folks paid for it. And we did it there at the GW Institute for Neuroscience. So thank you for your attention, and I will gladly take any questions. Mm-hmm. Yes, so once at weaning, we immediately delivered it in the water. And, you know, we've done the controls with just the vehicle alone. And it, I, it, so basically, they had it available. Of course, we don't know, based on their water consumption, you know, after weaning, how much is available. But certainly, it was available, and we saw consistent changes. Yeah, of course. I mean, we haven't done that yet. I mean, we decided that, and this was, okay, it was my fault. I said, well, you know, if this is going to work at all, we have to know whether chronic administration does anything. Because we could have tried our favorite three weeks or four weeks and come up bust, and then we wouldn't know anything. Um, so we know that this can work when it's working is an open, sub, is an open issue. And we're starting those experiments now. So the gene that's responsible is TXNRD2, which is localized to, mito to the mitochondrial matrix. It's not a membrane protein. It's a matrix protein. Um, and it is enhanced in expression generally in neuronal mitochondria. 
and as we found both at the message and protein level, <coughs> it is enhanced in layer 2, 3 projection neurons. The genomic lesion is not a loss of function, it's just diminished dosage. And so we're not looking at the, what happens when you lose function completely. What we're looking at is a 50 percent decrement. And we've done a lot of work that's already published in every part of the brain imaginable measuring expression levels after the deletion to make sure that there's no transcriptional or translational dosage compensation. For this gene, TXNRD2, there is none. And also, interestingly, and this is why the whole thing kind of came together, TXNRD2 prenatally in the fetal brain is not the primary path uh, rate limiting enzyme for ROS clearance. It's actually through the glutathione pathway, which is used more broadly. TXNRD2 expression right after birth increases about 10 to 15 fold. And so it seems like during that early postnatal period onward, this particular pathway, when we assume activity actually changes and circuits are beginning to become more functionally active, TXNRD2 takes over this metabolic job. Right. But in terms of the individual afferent uh, axonal arborization size, not right. really looking at that necessarily, I'm wondering if your ATP deficit, production deficit, might be the direct cause of assuming the axon arbors are smaller and right. the ability to maintain that presynaptic apparatus. If that's the that is really, that's the hypothesis that we have, and we think that you know, this may be partly due to the bioenergetic demands of endocytic signaling at the axon terminal. There is some evidence in some other, in Christensen syndrome in particular, that signaling endosomes, um, even before endocytosis for synaptic vesicle turnover, are disrupted, which disrupts trophic signaling and diminishes postnatal dendritic and axonal growth. And so I think the same thing may be going on, and that because of the increased bioenergetic demands of membrane trafficking, transport, and maintenance of assembly of these secretory specializations for synapses and for the growth cone, that we get this change. And the other thing that we really are now excited to do is to actually look at endocytosis first using at axon terminal endocytosis in particular, using the in vitro system, and also eventually to try to figure out how we can assay that in vivo as well. And so, it's a good question. Yeah. So the, the clathrin is only expressed at low levels in cerebral vasculature. So there's no indication that we or anybody else who's looked at this, that that's a contributory gene. Um, COMT was very exciting at the outset, but with the initial phenotypes that we've looked at, the phenotypes that um, Josh Gordon and, and Joe Gogos and their colleagues at Columbia looked like COMT did not seem to explain that, um, but the, the broader deletion did. Um, their hypothesis was that another one of the mitochondrial genes, and this was looking at hippocampal frontal synchrony, that one, another one of the mitochondrial genes might actually contribute to that. Um, but um, the other things that we've looked at are TBX1, ProDH, um, and uh, RAN BP1. The RAN story is interesting because it actually seems to be one of the key contributory genes for the basal progenitor phenotype, but it doesn't seem to disrupt the dendritic differentiation, and we can do that by taking it out at different times. We've already published part of that story. So whether or not TXNRD2 alone explains this, I would not argue for that. There are human TXNRD2 mutations. They tend to be biallelic homozygous, so they're two different alleles, but, and 
the individuals who survive, who have been identified, have a huge metabolic problem because the other thing is, is that TXNRD2 is not only the key mechanism for ROS clearance in neurons, it's also key for cardiac myocytes. And so the phenotype that's seen there. Now, that doesn't discount the fact that there could be a contribution for cardiac development in the, because there are other cardiovascular malformations that are primarily TBX1 dependent. But we do not see any of this in a TBX1 mutant alone who has the same cardiovascular malformations. This is, you know, we've taken advantage of it, and we know clinically that these individuals are variable in terms of every metric you can imagine with the same starting lesion. I don't have a good answer for you. I mean, I think part of it is, is that dosage rather than loss of function is a very different starting point for changing molecular regu regulatory networks because, you know, you're basically shifting stoichiometry and it's very possible that depending on genetic background and all sorts of things that you could have more or less homeostatic readjustments. And so that may give you outcomes. The other possibility, and this is something that we're looking at in another circuit in another aspect, is that depending on prenatal and postnatal environmental exposures to a lot of different things, that you could actually start shifting outcomes. And, you know, there's all sorts of reasons to, that that might be the case. And indeed, for the heart phenotypes, we've already published a paper where we know that the deletion actually resets the buffering, if you will, of the response of the embryo, both genetically and pharmacologically, to a number of sort of cardinal inductive signals, including the sonic signaling pathway, the retinoid signaling pathway, the FGF signaling pathway, the BMP signaling pathway. So if you've made that early sensitivity actually increased, where, you know, if you do a genetic or environmental insult that in a wild type litter mate embryo will cause no phenotype, but get a huge phenotype in the large deletion, then you could imagine that you know, even mild changes environmentally could actually lead to early disruptions that then concatenate out. Please join me in thanking Dr. Macho for that. Thank you. Thank you.